Well, hey, everybody, it's just uh, so great to be with you all, as John has mentioned, as we're wrapping up our series, uh, Better For It. And if, if you've been with us, uh, is that you know, is the series uh, follows the story of a guy named Joseph. Uh, and you uh, hear about a story um, in, the, uh, in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis. And, and uh, now you might be here and maybe you're not like really a God, Bible, Jesus kind of person. Maybe you're just kind of here checking it out or you're checking us out online. Uh, and, uh, and so a lot of the stuff is kind of new, but it's likely that you've uh, heard of Genesis, uh, and it might be that you even read the book of Genesis, and, and I bet that you're familiar with names like Adam and Eve, and Noah, and Abraham, and, uh, and, and all these guys, and, uh, but, but the Genesis account ends with, with Joseph and his story, and, and you know, there's a way of looking at Scripture uh, where we can observe, you know, the more God talks about a person, the more that we should probably be paying attention about that person. Uh, you know, and it's easy actually to browse through the 50 chapters of Genesis, you know, with uh, the calculator on your phone and then just check out the different char uh, characters in the book of Genesis and to figure out how many chapters are devoted to their lives. And so it's really easy to do that. You can start off with Adam and Eve. And if you do, is that you'd find out with Adam and Eve is, uh, is that there's five chapters you know, devoted to Adam and Eve, actually chapters one through five, really easy to do. Then you go to uh, Noah, uh, five as well. Uh, you know, the guy, you know, with the animals, the ark guy, you know, five as well, clocks in at that. And then you get to Abraham. Wow, Abraham's big. Abraham, 13. And, uh, and, and rightfully so, because Abraham is a really big deal. You see the ark of Abraham's story all throughout the Old Testament and then going into the New Testament where writers like Paul and James talk a lot about Abraham. And of course, there are three major faith systems in the world that claim him, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And then we get to Joseph and we find that Joseph, well, Joseph clocks in at 13 as well. That's amazing. It, it begs the question. The question is, why does God value Joseph's story so much? And, and because, perhaps he does because we've all got to deal with it. We've been talking about it uh, during our series, and Joseph has a lot of it. Now, now, for you and I, is that our it might have been really something that happened that was done to us. Uh, but for others of us, is that it, our it, is that something that we kind of did to ourselves? Now, for some of us, that it is that it, it was an event, um, it was a moment, it was an incident. Uh, but for others of us, is that it has just been kind of this lifelong thing that's been going on, this thing that we just can't seem to shake. Now, for many of us, is the last 12 months have been chock full of it because of the COVID world that we've been living in, like, you know, the it that has affected our health and our jobs, maybe our, our schooling, uh, certainly our relationships with family and, and friends. And so you're saying, Lyle, what's the it? Well, here's the it. The it is loss and disappointment and, and, and pain. And what we've been saying all along in this series is that, is that pain without gain is a shame and, and that we all know that. We think, you know what, you know, pain without gain, you know, it'd be a real bummer if, uh, if it didn't really have any sort of redemptive value to it. But you know what else? Here's, here's the other thing, is that in our world, pain is increasingly creating shame. Did you know that? Because you see, in our culture, in our culture, is that we're seeing our culture kind of shift and move away uh, from a culture that has turned their backs on, on God and kind of doesn't want anything to do with God and, and, and kind of wants to have no faith, you know, no faith. And, and, and as a result of that, when something's wrong, when something's difficult, when death and disease are at the door, is that we can't seem to make sense of it other than identifying it as weakness or even defeat. Well, let me tell you what I mean. Uh, Mark Sayers, a, a, a pastor and author, a favorite uh, pastor and author of mine, tells a story about a woman who lives in his neighborhood who was stricken by cancer, but never let her friends know about it. Uh, she went month after month uh, with, without them knowing. And, and, but in time, you know, they noticed the weight loss and they noticed the hair loss. And so they asked her about it. And then finally, you know, she confessed she came clean had cancer. And she didn't want anybody to know. And she didn't want to talk about it because she felt shame for it. She felt shame for it. She was ashamed because in her worldview, there was no possibility that she could be better for it. So perhaps God decided to give us 13 chapters worth of Joseph's life to help us to know what to do 
with pain because pain is all over his resume. Here's the resume of jo Joseph Jacobson. He was kidnapped once, sold twice, framed, and imprisoned. And all the while, all the while, all the while is that no one is looking for Joseph and no one is looking out for Joseph. But the ray of hope in it all is that we see Joseph has a superpower. He's got a superpower. It's his response ability. His response ability. Responsibility. Now here's how, here's how this works. Is that when, you know, when something goes, when something goes bad, you know, when something goes off the rails, what do we normally do? We don't respond. We react, right? Like we fly off the handle. You know I mean? We freak out oftentimes. We get mad. We let our emotions drive us rather than the facts driving us in the heat of the moment in the heat of the moment we then do things that 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 we come to regret yeah now now but in joseph is that we see a different kind of response we see a measured response we see a wise response we see a thoughtful response we see a grace filled faith filled response and, and we're going to see it again as the arc of his story is going to take a turn for the better but uh, in order to get us there, I want to give us just a, a real quick review of where we've been so far. Is that we have discovered that Joseph is the 11th of 12 brothers, and he was the favored brother of his dad. And he was the guy that had a crazy dreams, and he had a bright coat that he wore. And those two things uh, created a hatred from his brothers. They hated him for it. And so there came a day uh, when his, he and his brothers were outside tending the family's flocks where they seize him, throw him down a well, and, and sell him to Ishmaelite merchants uh, and then report back to his father Jacob and said, hey, you know what? Nobody knows where Joseph is, but you know, here's his coat and it's all ripped up and it's bloody. And so, you know, kind of do the math, you know, who knows? You know, he's probably dead. Now, now, while that's going on, is that Joseph is sold again, this time to the Egyptian Potiphar. And, and he gets in this no-win situation with Potiphar's wife. He's framed, and then he's tossed in jail. And, and, and it's in jail that he encounters a couple of guys uh, that are there that were a part of Pharaoh's court and that they had been demoted. One was the cupbearer, the other was a baker becomes friends with these guys. He hears that they're having some crazy dreams and, and somehow God has given uh, Joseph wisdom and insight into dreams and how to interpret them. And so he hears their dreams and for the cupbearer, he helps them out. And for the baker, not so much. So, so the cupbearer, we find, was restored to his former position serving Pharaoh uh, and, and he goes, uh, and, and he just kind of jumps back into his position and he just kind of forgets about Joseph for a couple of years until Pharaoh begins to have some crazy dreams as well. He's overhearing these dreams that he has. Pharaoh said, I'm having these dreams. No one can seem to figure them out. And the cupbearer said, hey, Pharaoh, I know a guy. I know a guy who interprets dreams. <laughs> oh, man, what was that guy's name? Oh, yeah, Joseph. Yeah, he's down in the prison. And so they pluck him out of his jail cell. Uh, they clean him up, give him a shave and a shower, put him before Pharaoh, and he interprets Pharaoh's dream. Pharaoh explains to him, hey, 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 the dream goes like this. There were seven healthy cows swallowed by seven skinny cows. And then, and then, and then. And then there were seven healthy heads of grain in my dream consumed by seven skinny heads of grain. So what's the meaning? Well, Joseph said, you know what? I can't really help you, but interpretations belong to God. God will help. And so here's the interpretation that God gives Joseph to pass into Pharaoh. He says, he says Pharaoh, these dreams mean that, that uh, coming up, there's going to be seven years of very bountiful harvest followed by seven years of famine. And so if I were you, and he gives some advice, you know, if I were you, if I were you, is that I'd find someone to manage well these coming uh, seven years, these good seven years. And Pharaoh said, Joseph, it's done because I'm picking you to manage all of this. You're going to be the prime minister, as it will, the second person in command in all of Egypt. And I want you to oversee this project, uh, uh, this agricultural project uh, of, of harvesting the grain. And so it happens. And so it happens, there's seven good years, and that Joseph oversees uh, it all. It's all stored up, all the crops and the grain, and when the famine comes, and the famine comes, they're ready. And, 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 and Joseph, well, he keeps Egypt from starving, while at the same time, he makes a financial killing as well for Egypt. 
But as is the case of famines today, they, they cross borders. I mean, you know, the whole known world, it appears, is suffering from this famine, including a little tribe north of there, a place called Canaan, led by a man named Jacob. And that's where we enter the story in Genesis chapter 42, verse 1. Love to have you follow along with the Bible if you got one handy. Or go ahead and take that app out. And then we've got the message notes that are there on your app as well. Genesis 42, verse 1 says this. It says, When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? <laughs> it just tells you the family dynamic, right? Everything you need to know. This guy's had it up to here with them. He continued, he says, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then 10 of his brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. And you're thinking, wait a minute, I thought there were 11 brothers that were still there. What happened to number 11? Well, he explains. He says, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons, by the way, Israel is the name for Joseph, or, or for Jacob, rather. Uh, God had renamed Jacob Israel. Okay, so Israel, Jacob, same guy. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan. All right, so here's the situation, right? Here's the situation. Now, Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all his people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Now, I want you to think about that moment and what might be flashing through Joseph's mind. I mean, maybe it was that dream, that, that, that crazy dream that he told his brothers about, you know, about uh, all the way back when he was a teenager, this dream that he had about these stalks of grain, about their stalks of grain bowing to his stock of grain. Or, or maybe this was a trigger moment that took him back, not to the dream, but to the pain, to, to, to the trauma. The, the trauma. Trauma. Now, now that's something uh, that's a part of our story, isn't it? In, in some sort of way, right? Either the, the trauma that we have personally experienced in life or, or the trauma that has been experienced by someone that is close to us. But be, because there's pain, right? And there's trauma. And, and that when it comes to Joseph's story, is it pain doesn't seem to fully describe his experience. No, man, he suffered trauma. I mean, what would you say about a friend that you knew who had been physically abused by family members as a boy and then human trafficked, sold into slavery, not once, but twice, and then was sexually assaulted and then was sent to prison, to, uh, left there to rot in a prison cell for the bulk of his young adult life for a crime that he didn't commit? I mean, what would you say about a kind of person like that? Well, you say that person has experienced trauma and then some. And, and yet God sees fit to give us his story. And that's a big part of the story is his trauma. But the bigger part of the story, the bigger part of the story is this, is that the Lord was with Joseph. That's the bigger part. The Lord was with Joseph when he was a slave in Potiphar's house, when he was a prisoner in the prison, all the while as a the Lord was with Joseph. God had not left Joseph. And God has not left us without any examples of those who have suffered trauma and made it to the other side. But, but, but you wouldn't blame Joseph if, if he had some things, you know, sorted out. You know, there's that moment, you know, where uh, his brothers appear. They want to buy grain. They don't recognize him. I mean, you wouldn't blame him if he was like, wow, this is really, I'm having a hard time really wrapping my head around all of this. And so in the chapters to come, he kind of plays this cat and mouse game with his brothers. There's, there's extra trips back and forth to Canaan. Uh, there's some funny money stuff going on where they, they pay for the grain and then the money reappears in the bags of grain. 
as they're heading out of town. And then there's valuable articles placed in grain bags, uh, you know, and then accusations. And then even some hostage taking is going on. And maybe all the while, all the while, this is just kind of a play that Joseph is making just to test to see if they have remorse. So Joseph plays dumb. Joseph plays aloof. He plays a little mad. But finally, when he's before his brothers, still concealing his identity, and the scene is tense, Genesis 45, verse 1, tells us this. It says, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, his Egyptian attendants, and cried out, Make everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it, and everybody's, you know, thinking... Man, this is getting all a little weird. <laughs> and then the next verse, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. I, I'm, I'm Joseph. I mean, here it is. Here it is. I mean, they're thinking, man, this is the big reveal. I mean, there's just no way. There's Joseph. And then he asked the question. He asked the question, is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence, absolutely speechless. Then Joseph said to his brothers, he said, come close to me, come close to me, to which they must have been thinking, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh oh, because this is the moment in the story, you know, that we've seen in stories before. I mean, isn't this the time, you know, in the story when the scales are balanced? When justice is served, when the bad guys get their comeuppance, when the hero so wounded gets to exact his sweet revenge. I mean, we've seen it before. We've seen it before, haven't we? We've seen it in the movies. Bruce Willis in Die Hard, those Liam Neeson taken movies, that renovant movie, you know, the Western with Leonardo DiCaprio. I mean, heck, even Star Wars happened. Luke Skywalker blows up the Death Star and Darth Vader is just uh, cartwheeling through the universe and we're like, yes, it's all about payback. It's all about payback. And Joseph then is saying, come close to me. Come close to me. And we're all anticipating him taking the dagger, thrusting it in and twisting it. But instead, what we see is Joseph using his superpower yet again. It says, when they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and, and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. So here's his response. It was a measured response. It was the wise response. It was the faith-filled, God-informed response. Instead of swords, swords drawn and heads rolling, it was his response ability that carries the day. And from that point forward, after the big reveal where, well, there's a lot less trauma and a lot more goodness flowing through the story. Father and son are reunited. Jacob and Joseph are. And the family's got food to eat. They survived the famine. And everybody settles down in the same area in Egypt. And, and they enjoy the safety of security that comes when your brother is the second most powerful man in Egypt. Probably the second most powerful man in the known world at the time. And after 17 years since that big reveal, since the big reveals that Jacob, his father dies at a ripe old age. And here's what happens next in Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. It says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? See, they know this is just kind of how the way things work in the world. I mean, most of the time, because you see, most of the time, it happens. Whether that be for us, pain or disappointment or loss or trauma, it happens and we hold a grudge. And then we wait for the right timing to pay it all back, which is the problem of it. That's the problem of it is that often, often, we're not better for it. We're bitter from it. I mean, it's easy to hold a grudge. 
It's easy to, 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 to be bitter. And if, and if you and I had time together to sit around the room over a cup of coffee or over, or over breakfast and just kind of share our life story is that you and I would have these moments of pain and loss and disappointment and even trauma. And, and, and working, through, working through is that there would be these, these times when we would just have to confess and says, yeah, you know what, I held a grudge. Yeah, you know what, I, I, I'm bitter. And, and that we would say in return, you know what, that is completely understandable. The problem is, it's just not sustainable. I mean, you would think, oh, give them a hall pass, you know, but you know what, you, if you continue to live life that way, uh, the, your life uh, projects in that direction is that you're going to find yourself in a place that you're not going to want to be. You're going to find yourself hurt and alone and angry and bitter. And none of us want that. You know, none of, none of, us, none of us want that. You know, I, I've never met anyone <laughs> ever that says, you know what, is that I just want to be a world-class grudge holder. I've never met anybody like that. Uh, uh, but, but it can happen. It can happen. And, and so, uh, you know, understand is that all of us have got wounds. All of us have got wounds. But, you know, bitterness is the thing that happens when all we do is really dwell on, on our wounds. So, so continuing on, take a look. Is it, so it says, they sent word to Joseph saying, <laughs> your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. And who knows why he wept, but maybe, maybe it was because Joseph knew that it was, that it was all made up. And, and that, that they would stoop so low to pull this stunt. I mean, well, that's heartbreaking. But then his brothers doubled down. They doubled down. It says, his brothers then came and threw themselves down before him and says, we're your slaves, they said. <laughs> oh, and this is where we can see his response ability, his superpower show up one last time. This is what Joseph said to them. He says, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God. He said, come on, guys, guys, guys. Am I in the, am I in the, in, in the place of, of God? I mean, you know, deciding right from wrong, you know, that's God's thing. I, I mean, he sorts that out, not me, but as for you, as for you, you, you intended to harm me. That's, that's the truth. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And there it is. The measured response, the wise response, the truth-filled response, the faith-filled response. And, and all the while, all the while is that he's showing this awareness that, that his story, his story has intersected with God's big story in, in all of this, God's bigger story. See, see it, it, it just continues to become clear to Joseph that God was using all of it, all the pain, all the loss, all the disappointment, all the trauma, and that God was using it because God was up to something bigger. You see, you see, preserving his family meant that 12 tribes would emerge and form a nation, a nation called Israel. And, and through that nation, an ancestral line would then bring a Messiah named Jesus who would come to bless all the nations and enact the saving of many lives, in fact, the saving of all humanity. And, and, and so he has this awareness that his story is just so much bigger than his story. His story becomes so much bigger than just his story and that we know that by just locking into these two little words, but God, but, but God in verse 20, but God. He, he sees the intersection of his story with a great story of God. And he's seen this for quite a while, for years now. And yet he just shares with it again. And, and this leads us then all to a question. As, as we work through deciding what to do with our it, with our pain, with our loss, with our disappointment, with our trauma. And it's a question that I think that can help us develop the superpower of responsibility. Here's the question. How would someone in your circumstances respond if they were confident God was with them? Because that's Joseph's story, right? God was with him in Potiphar's house, in the jail, all throughout, God was with him. So the question, how would someone in your circumstances respond if they were confident God was with them? And maybe you're looking at this question, you're saying, so Lyle, yeah, you know what? I see the question, and here's the problem. Here's my problem. I mean, how do I know that God's with me? 
I mean, you know, how, how do I know? I mean, I, you know, I can't see God, right? And, and, and rarely are there moments where I feel that God is there. Well, when Jesus, a descendant of Joseph, arrives on the scene and pours his life into his followers, into his, into his disciples, is that he would have known full well that that would have been a problem for them too. Uh, that, that's going to be tough for them. It's going to be an issue for them. And, and so what then could Jesus do to reassure his disciples that he would always, always be with them? And, and so we come to a moment in his life. It was actually the night before that he was crucified that he met with his disciples uh, in an upper room, an upstairs room. They were there to celebrate the Passover meal. And as Jewish men, they had celebrated the Passover meal scores of times by sharing this meal together. But Jesus would then take this meal and kind of move it in a direction that they would never see coming because he began by taking the common food elements of the Passover meal, very common, and using them in a very uncommon way. He began by taking the bread. And he took the bread and he said, guys, he says, this bread is my body. It will be broken for you. I, I will sacrifice my body for you in this way, and I'll, I'll do it because I love you. And as you get to eat it, it goes into you to remind you that I'm with you. There's the bread. And later on that night, Jesus took the cup, a cup of wine. He said, guys, he said, guys this cup is a new covenant of my blood. It's, it's going to be how your sins are paid for is that I give it freely to you because I love you and, and you get to drink it. It goes into you so that it reminds you that I'm with you. And you know, this would be the very first time that Jesus would connect with his disciples in this way, but it's not the last time that this connection, this type of connection occurs because this way of remembering the presence of God in our lives would move forward through the arc of history uh, close to 2,000 years worth of history as Jesus' followers grounded themselves in this practice with, with what we call the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist or what we're going to call tonight uh, communion. So, so today, so today we get to do the same. We get to ground ourselves in it. We get to celebrate what God has done that we could never do by, by dying the death that we deserve and then raising from the dead, showing that death would have no power or mastery over God and, and now um, that God leads the way uh, to us, leads the way to new life, leads the way to eternal life through the work of Jesus Christ by dying on the cross and rising the dead three days later. And we get to remember all this. We get to remember all this while at the same time remembering that God's with us, that, that he's present, that he's in us. And, and he's working in us and through us and even with our pain and our disappointment and our loss and our trauma is that we can be better for it. And so I would like for you to take uh, the elements. Um, if you're here uh, tonight at the hub, you can go ahead and take what we've got here for you. We're going to go ahead and peel off the, the uh, top cover. For those of you at home, uh, hopefully you've got some bread. And let's go ahead and take the bread together. And as we do know this, the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Take eat of it in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread together. In the same way, on the same night, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup, is the new covenant of my blood. Drink of it in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the cup together. Amen. So one last thing uh, before we close that I think can really help us as we, we seek to be better for it. And, and it means that we need to go back again to that Passover meal, that Passover evening, that, that evening with Jesus that was that was full of these symbols that Jesus gave them and us, but also full of words of encouragement. Jesus spent time with his disciples and he told them how to stay close to him, how, how to abide in him like, a, like a, a vine would abide and connect to a branch. And then, of course, he, he shares with them some challenges that they're going to have to come, some, some big, tough challenges, but all the while, 
And those challenges that he promises his Holy Spirit to come as a comforter, as a guide. And then he wraps it all up in John chapter 16, verse 33, with just this one verse. Uh, just wraps it all up for us. He says this to his disciples. He says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. And I love this next line. He says, in this world you will have trouble. Jesus always spoke the truth. These are true words, right? In this world, you'll have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So, so I see in this, Jesus opening a door to a beautiful story that he wants to write in your life and mine. And, and, and it's a story not, it's a story of a victim, but it's a story of an overcomer. Our story is not the story of a victim. It's the story of one who has overcome because Jesus has overcome. Overcoming all the it, all the pain, all the loss, all the disappointment, all the trauma, all of those things during those times, you know, when we're saying, but you know what, I feel like I am a victim and I did get dealt a, a really bad hand and it all, and where was God in the middle of it? And he says, I've overcome. Now you can overcome because you are with me. Whatever that it is, be it loss or pain, or disappointment, or trauma, you don't have to be bitter from it, but you can be better for it. And if you're interested in a life like that, in a spiritual journey that looks like that, that's pointed in that direction, you're gonna love our next series called Starting Point. And that's what we have in store for you next time, but for now, let me pray with you. Lord God, we take heart in your words and we need them because because there are times when we feel like there's so much we have to overcome in this life. And so we look to you, we seek you. Jesus, we exalt you as the one who has overcome the world and we take heart in you today in the name of Jesus, the overcomer, the conquering king and victor, we pray, amen, amen. Well, listen, just as we... Uh, finish things out today. I just wanted to uh, remind you about some things that uh, we'd love to have you engage in. The first would be that kind of card that John talked to you about. We'd love to have everybody take some time to fill that card out. Make sure that you spend some time doing that. We also wanted to let you know is that giving is easy. Lots of different options, um, ways to give and to be able to connect uh, in that way. And, and then uh, we're really excited about life groups that are uh, coming up. And so we want to encourage you to take this week to either uh, use that brochure, fill it out, or find the life group listing in your app and uh, pick out the group that you're going to be in. And that will be awesome. Awesome. And then we'll see you next time for Starting Point. It's going to be great. In the meantime, may God bless you. And thanks again so much for joining us. Everything has a beginning. It's a driving force in our human experience. Every person... Every idea, every journey starts somewhere. Whether it's one small step in a new direction or a catalyst that ignites a spark, it's a moment when, from this point forward, nothing will ever be the same. It's not always comfortable. It's not always easy. But it is a start.